Amen. Good job, Brother Ryan. <laughs> that's, that's a rough one. And I was almost laughing out loud um, in the back because the funny thing is we're going to spend several weeks getting through this chapter, so you're going to have to do that again, all right? So, <laughs> it's, I know, this is one of those chapters in the Bible that you can read really fast, like just reading it to yourself. You can just like zip through this thing in like a minute. But when you have to like pronounce everything, it's just like, ah, Tim, blah, 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 you know? <laughs> these, these names, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, Hazen, North Dakota, you know, it's not, not quite that simple. Anyway, uh, Joshua chapter 19. So we're, we're studying through the, the tribes of Israel, and we're just going to go down to verse number 9 um, this evening, and we're going to look at the tribe of Simeon. So look down at Joshua chapter 19, um, and look at verse number 1. We're going to look at the tribe of Simeon, and there's an interesting story um, to Simeon, and I don't know that I've actually preached through this whole story before. So we're going to look at the, the life of Simeon and how that affected um, the tribe and their inheritance in the, in the promised land. So of course this is Joshua in these last few chapters um, cutting up the land in the promised land. They've come into the promised land. They've conquered the land for the most part. Um, or, you know, they've, they've conquered enough to divide up um, amongst the 12 tribes of Israel, and that's what we're looking at for the last few weeks. Look at verse number 1. And the second lot, the Bible says, came forth to Simeon, even for the tribe of the children of Simeon, according to their families. And their inheritance was with the inheritance of the children of Judah. So that's a really um, important point right there in verse number 1. And then in the next few verses, it gives the cities that are inside uh, Simeon, and then it gives um, the borders. But it basically says that the inheritance was within the inheritance of Judah. So if you look at a, a map of the 12 tribes of Israel, one thing you'll notice about the tribe of Simeon is you have the, the tribe of Judah in the south, and then inside that is this tribe is where Simeon received their inheritance. Basically, it was a, it was a cut-out part of the tribe of Judah. Look at verse number 9. And the Bible says, out of the portion of the children of Judah was the inheritance of the children of Simeon. For the part of the children of Judah was too much for them. Therefore, the children of Simeon had their inheritance within the inheritance of them. So let's look at the tribe of Simeon and see why they kind of had this. They kind of had a lesser inheritance when you think about it. Uh, look at Genesis chapter 49. Go back to Genesis chapter 49. So, of course, Genesis chapter 49 is where we're looking, we're seeing Jacob's uh, blessings on his sons, and these blessings are really prophecies on what would come of um, his sons. And, of course, you know, Simeon, just don't forget, Simeon is not um, the person that's inheriting this land. Jacob is giving this blessing to his son some 500 years before they even come into the promised land. So keep that in mind, but look at these blessings that Jacob gives his sons, and we'll see that they're actually prophecies of what will come of these tribes. Look at Genesis chapter 49, and look at verse number 5. And Jacob, he gives the blessing to Simeon along with the blessing to Levi, and you'll see why in a few minutes. Look at um, verse number 5. Simeon and Levi are brethren. And then this is what Jacob says, blessing these two together. He says, Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly, mine honor be not thou united. For there in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So here we see why Simeon receives, first of all, Levi received no land. Levi received no land. We'll talk about that in a later sermon, but Levi's inheritance was the Lord. They were the Levites. They received no land as inheritance at all. And Simeon, he says, they'll be divided and scattered in Israel. And we'll see that that's actually what takes place later on. But he basically is giving a curse to Simeon and Levi here instead of a blessing. Go back to Genesis chapter 34 and let's look at why this is. He basically says instruments of cruelty um, are, you know, are, are, your, are your habitations. He's, he says you, you've, been, you've been angry, you've been wrathful, and you killed 
a man. You know, basically we're going to see that it was much more than a man is what they killed. So let's look at what happened that caused Jacob to give this type of curse to his two sons. And we're focusing specifically on Simeon. Look at Genesis chapter 34 and verse number 1. The story begins, here we have um, Dina, or Dinah, as many people, um, I, I knew someone who was married to a, uh, someone named Dina, but we'll call, it, call her Dinah. And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob. So Jacob also had a daughter, and his daughter's name was Dinah. Went out to see the daughters of the land. Verse number 2. And when Seshem, the son of Hamer the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. So the first thing that we need to understand is this is, in verse number 2, there's several things that have happened here. Okay, we had, first of all, Dina has gone out um, with the daughters of the land. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But then she met this, this man, this Seshem, the son of Hamar, the Hivite. So the Hivites, they're, they're the people outside the camp. These are the, the, uh, the heathens that they're not to mix with. They're not to um, marry. They're not to take them unto marriage. They're not to go in unto them, unto marriage. God has, has, has you know, proclaimed separation from these people. But Dinah goes out with the daughters of the land, and then this man, he takes her, that's the first thing, and he lays with her, and then he defiles her. So the first thing that I want to talk about is like what actually happened here, because there's a lot of confusion on this story, and it really turns to some, like, some Bible version um, things that we're going to look at this evening as well. So first of all, what did this man do to Dinah? It's one of the biz biggest misreads of the Bible. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 22. So, first of all, we know that lie with her means that, you know, they had, you know, physical relations. Okay, so they had um, physical relations between a man and a woman. That's what that means. And defiled her. We'll talk about that later. But when it says he took her, what does that mean? Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy chapter 22, especially the last half of Deuteronomy chapter 22, it deals with the law according to marital relations, talking about um, someone who was, uh, you know, um, not a virgin before they, be they got married. It talks about um, what happens if someone um, forces, um, you know, a woman to have, you know, to have a physical relationship against her will, you know, what you would call rape today, you know, um, so that's what Deuteronomy 22 talks about, and then several other scenarios as well. But look at Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse number 25. So we're talking about marriage, betrothal, physical relations between a man and a woman, and the, what the law says about this, okay? Now look at Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 25. First of all, we're not going to look at it, but previously, in the verses previous, it talks about what happens if a woman commits fornication and then doesn't, you know, tries to, you know, cover that up and then goes and gets married and it's found out. And fornication in Deuteronomy chapter 22 in the Old Testament, fornication meaning a physical relationship between a man and a woman before marriage or outside of marriage, that is actually punished by death in Deuteronomy chapter 22. It's very harsh, which shows us, look, it shows us how serious God takes that sin. That's what we take from that when we read these things in the Old Testament. But there's a lot of confusion on the end of Deuteronomy chapter 22, if, especially if you don't have a King James Bible. If you have a King James Bible, there's not confusion, and I'm going to show you that this evening. Now let's look at verse 25. Look what the Bible says, Deuteronomy 22, 25. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field... Now betrothal in the Bible, let me just kind of break this down for you. There is no equivalent today to betrothal in the Bible. Betrothal in the Bible means you were promised to a man before the, before the marriage was physically consummated, you were betrothed. There was a betrothal period. But it was considered the same as being married in the Bible. Okay, so there was no difference between being betrothed as far as the laws of adultery and things like that in the Bible. So look at um, Deuteronomy 22 and 25, verse 25. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, and the man, what does this say right here? You need to underline this in your Bible because many people misinterpret the Bible because they don't have the right Bible on these verses. And the man force her and lie with her. 
then the man only that lie with her shall die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. This is the Bible very clearly teaching that the sin of what people would call rape today is punishable the same as murder. That is very clear here in the Bible. He forced her. She has done no sin worthy of death. For when a man, it's the sa same as a man killing his neighbor, the Bible says. It's the equivalent. Look at verse 27. There's even more evidence here. For he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried. She yells out. She yells out for help, and there was none to save her. So here, I mean, we see this number one. He forced her, and then she cried, and no one saved her. So she needed to be saved. She cried, and she was forced. It's very clear that this was not a consensual situation. This is what you know, we would call today, or what they would call today, um, the, the, the crime of rape here. And it's punishable by the death of the uh, perpetrator. Now look at verse 28. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her, and lie with her, and they be found. Okay, this is talking about two people that have committed consensual fornication together, is what this is talking about. He, you know, everyone says, oh, lay hold on her means that he forced her. That is not what this means. It means that, I mean, it means that he, he handled her. He, you know, he has contact with her, and this was not a forced situation. There was no crying, there's no word force, and there's no one that needed to save her. And it says, they be found. Then the man that lie with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife, because he hath humbled her. He may not put her away all his days. Now, the only reason that it talks about a damsel that is betrothed and not betrothed is because this is saying in the last part of Deuteronomy chapter 22 that if two people that are not betrothed to each other, there's no adultery involved here. It's only fornication that they are to get married. That's what it is saying. He said that is the answer. He's to, he's to pay a fine to her father and then they are to get married if they had committed fornication together. Now, obviously, that situation would not work if she was betrothed because now it's an adultery situation. And that's a whole nother set of punishments. Okay? So this is very clear if you have a King James Bible, that if there's a situation where a woman is forced, where you know, she is sexually assaulted or raped, as, the, you know, as they would say today, that, that is punishable by death. Very clearly in the Bible. But now, here's the problem. Pull out your NIV. Pull out your NIV tonight. Let me just read for you Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 28 from the NIV. And here's what the Bible says in the NIV. So the Bible says this, in, you know, the, the NIV says this. If a man happens to meet a virgin who is not pledged to be married and rapes her, and they are discovered, he shall pay her father 50 shekels of silver. He must marry the young woman, for he has violated her. He can never divorce her as long as she lives. So how many people have ever heard that, you know, somebody who's never read the Bible, who doesn't believe, who's not a Christian, who's an atheist or whatever, and is just arguing against the Bible, say, well, the Bible says that, you know, a woman can be raped and, and then she has to marry the rapist. I mean, how many people, I've heard that so many times from people who are against Christianity, against the Bible. And here's the thing, the new modern Bible versions, that's exactly what they say. That's exactly what the NIV says. Now, if that doesn't get you to just drop your NIV and get a King James Bible right there, I don't know what would. I mean, the NIV literally says that the rapist of a woman is to marry her. So, I mean, you know, someone rapes, you know, someone that you know or your daughter or whatever, and, and then they have, to, they have to marry that person. I mean, that's ridiculous. It's stupid. Look, this shows you that there's an agenda, by the way, to not only change the Bible, but to make the Bible look stupid and evil. To get people, look, that would turn, look, if I, if that is what the Bible actually said, that would have turned me off to the Bible. Because I've told you a uh, hundred times before, look, if the Bible is wrong in one place, 
If the Bible says something stupid and crazy and obviously wrong or contradictory in one place, can you trust any of it? You can't. That NIV verse right there is, is, should be enough to just turn everybody to the King James Bible. That one thing alone. It's one of the most like in-your-face, you know, just, just errors. That, but I don't think these things are an accident. Go back to Genesis chapter 34. Let's go back to Sim Simeon and Levi. The point, all that to say this. By taking hold of her, these two committed fornication together. There was no forcing of anything in this situation. Dinah went out with the daughters of the land and she committed fornication. She had relations, consensual relations outside of marriage with this man. Now let's look what happens. So she goes out. She commits fornication. And look, let me just say this. You know, look at that statement in, in verse number one that says the daughters of the land. Let me just say this. There's nothing new under the sun, folks. There's nothing new under the sun. This is what the daughters of the land do. This is what the daughters of the land do today. This is why the Bible, and we preach so much here, and over and over and over and over again, whether it comes from your children, to you, to school, we teach separation here. Because the daughters of the land, this is what they do. This is what they do. You say, well, you know, things are bad today. Yes, because that's what the people of the land do. Did you know that 3%, 3% of people today that get married, get married a virgin in the United States? 3%. This is what the people of the land do. This is why we need to be separated. We need to not be with the people of the land. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I mean, that Bible is teaching us to be separated for a specific reason, folks. So we don't fall into these same things. So basically, the Bible gives us all these commands many times in the New Testament. And then we see, you know, the results of not listening to these commands in many of the stories, the history of the Old Testament. It's really kind of a nice fit, especially in this one. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. So 1st and 2nd Corinthians, kind of the, the hinging sin of 1st and 2nd Corinthians is the sin of fornication. Is the big thing that is being addressed. Look at 2nd Corinthians 6 and verse 17. Wherefore, so in this context, knowing this context that we're talking about someone who is in fornication, then gotten right and is back, you know, out of fornication again, in this context, 2 Corinthians 6, 17 says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the what? Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. The main points of 1 and 2 Corinthians is dealing with someone who is put out of the church for fornication. Come out from among who? The people of the land. The daughters of the land that Dina went out with that Dinah went out with. The people that always, look, the people of the land are always going to go in this direction. There's nothing new under the sun. So if you want to avoid that, if you want your family to avoid that, you have to, you have to come out of that. You have to be separate from that. Go back to Genesis chapter 34. So you say, you know, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? You know, I mean, everybody out there is doing it today. What's the big deal? Look at verse number 2. He took her and he lay with her. So we know what they did. They got together. She went out with these worldly friends, these heathen friends. She got together with this guy and they committed fornication. But then look what it says. It says that by doing that, it says he did what? He defiled her. He defiled her. What does that mean? You know what that means? If you remember the verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 6 that we just read, it means he made her unclean. It means that he sullied or marred or spoiled. That's what, that's what defiled means. And look, now this has a literal and a spiritual meaning. This is by, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is why the Bible talks so seriously about fornication. Look, the Bible literally singles out fornication as a sin that is extra bad. It's extra bad. It's, it's, it's bad in a way that no other sins are bad. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 
And look at verse 18. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 18. So it says that Dinah was defiled. She was made unclean. She was, she was made dirty or, or she was spoiled is what that means. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 18. The Bible says, flee fornication. It says, run from it. If you see it coming, just get away. Every sin, now, now this is a strong statement right here. It says, every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. So it says that all the other sins that you do, you go out and you steal and you lie and you cheat and you embezzle and you extort and you do all these sins that are wicked, even like worshiping false idols and all these other things. It's like those are things you're doing outside your body. Those are things your body is doing outside. It's like, but committing fornication is literally a sin against your own literal flesh is what the Bible is saying here. And look, it says his own body. So I'm not just going to beat up on the ladies tonight. It's, it's defiling the man too. It's, it's man, it, you're sinning against your own body. It's not just a sin against your conscience. It's not just a sin against God. It's, you know, I mean, just think about it. Am I, I mean, is it wrong? Think about the disease, the cancer. I mean, fornication can literally kill you. It can literally kill you. I mean, it can literally, there's diseases that literally, it, it can kill you, it can cause cancer, it can make it so women can't have children. I mean, terrible physical consequences. And the percentages, I don't even, I didn't even, I didn't even want to look at the percentages you know, looking at it for the sermon, but it's, it's high. It's high. People that commit fornication, look, it's, it's a physic, it takes a physical toll on you. It literally makes you unclean. But even today, even today, now here's the really wicked thing, that today, I mean, you have been programmed, especially the people of the world have been programmed that it's no big deal. To the point where literally everybody's doing it. Literally all but 3% of people are doing it. Now, you think about it, the TV, you think about the TV programs, you think about the movies, you think about, I mean, I've shown you popular sitcoms where literally the main characters have had dozens and dozens and dozens of physical partners. But there's never any consequences. It's all funny. It's all a joke. Think about the movies. You know, look, it's just, it's, it's desensitizing you to a, a very serious sin. They can literally kill you. They can literally make it to where you can't have children. They can literally cause you diseases that you'll have for the rest of your life. I mean, it's such a, I mean, how many, I mean, really, seriously, folks, how many more things, I mean, why in the world do you have a TV? How many more things do you need to see that are on the TV, that are on programming that is coming from either Hollywood or the media or whatever that are just completely false. How many things do you all have to see before you just stop watching it? Do you also see why it's important? Why we sit here in the prayer list and we're like, you know what? Um, please help us to read our Bibles. Because guess what? If I'm feeding myself with garbage from TV and from movies and from stupid things on the internet that I shouldn't be watching and then I never read my Bible, what's going to happen to me? Am I going to become unsaved? No. I'm just going to fall into horrible sin. I mean, you have to be separated from this stuff. You have to be separated, and you're like, guess what? You're separated unto the Word of God. And then all of a sudden, the sin will seem exceedingly sinful to you. If you put that stuff away, and you start reading the Bible, and you start getting it plugged into a church, and you start soul winning, and you start learning what God actually has for you in your life, this sin is going to, I mean, you're going to look at the stuff out there, and you're going to be like, whoa! You're going to be like, I can't believe that people do that stuff. Like, it's going to shock you. Instead of just being like, yeah, that's just what everybody does. But think about what happened in this story. I mean, look, here's the thing. You know the TV stuff and you know the movie stuff is false because you know what? No matter what they tell you, that fornication is no big deal, that it's no big, everybody does it. Everyone, you know, sleeps around before they get married. Nobody goes to, to their marriage, you know, you know, a virgin anymore. Nobody does that stuff. Let's take a poll. All you young people, let's, how many of you young people now, when you think about your dream girl, or you think about your dream guy that's going to come along and you're going to get married, how many of you would really just not even care that they're just like, oh yeah, and I've just slept with lo lots of people. I was just a whore for years. Sorry about that. 
I was just a whoremonger for years. Look, that would bother anybody. You know why? Because you have a conscience. Because God wrote that in your heart. That's why. That program, you know, TV and all that, like, nobody likes that. How's this for feminism, by the way? Feminism is the worst thing that has ever happened to women, ever. Yeah, it's been real great for women. Going out and telling women, it's just basically, it's turned them into unpaid prostitutes. This is what feminism has done for women in the United States. It's turned them into murderers. That's what feminism has done. It's okay. It's okay to fornicate. Oh, man, there's consequences to fornication. Oh, well, the Bible told you that. Oh, just commit murder. That'll make it better. I've told you, I just met somebody a few weeks ago. Woman was 50 years old. Still feels bad about murdering a child 20 years ago. Is crying in her doorstep when she murdered her child 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Thanks, feminism. Literally wrecking people's lives. Literally murdering millions and millions and millions, tens of millions of unborn children. Look, if you care about your daughters today, man, you will separate them. You don't send them out in the world because guess what? They're going to be defiled out there. The public school, by the way, the public school equals fornication. The public school, that, that's what's going to happen there. I can't tell you how many good men, good family men, good fathers that I've met over the last 20 years and as their kids grow up and they're just like, I can't believe what's happening and their, their kids are all going into fornication. And guess what? They're not like, oh yeah, everybody's doing it. They hate it. They don't like it. But they're, they're, they're dumb. They're dumb. They're programmed. They're programmed, but you know what? Their conscience tells them it's wrong. They just don't know how to fix it. Guess what? We're not dumb. We need to, and look, if you're, if you're programming yourself, you need to, you're, you're walking in danger zone. And guess what? You, 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 generations later are going to pay. Well, you got to get them out. You got to separate them. You got to teach them the truth. Look, teach them to have respect for themselves. Amen. Teach them not to sin against their own body. Teach them to respect. Hey, here's a good one. Teach them to respect their future spouse. How about that? How about that? Teach them to separate themselves under the Word of God so they can have a beautiful, lifelong marriage. Amen. Which I am convinced that it is one of the, the best blessings that God gives us on this earth. Amen. I'm convinced of it. I'm not saying I have a perfect marriage. I'm saying that it, it is a beautiful, wonderful blessing to have a, a, a strong, lifelong marriage. Look, folks, everything that the world teaches is wrong. Amen. Everything that the world teaches is wrong. You have to deprogram yourself. And shame on all of you if you're programming yourself. I don't know how much I have to scream up here on, on becoming separate and not polluting yourself with this garbage. It's everywhere. Just tell, look, and, and just look, you gotta, you gotta, as far as deprogramming yourself, here's how you start. You say, you know what, if it's in the Bible, it's true. If it's in the Bible, it's true. If it's in the Bible, that's what I'm gonna believe. If it's in the Bible, that's what I'm gonna do. Go back to Genesis 34. Let's get back to the story. The clock up here says I've been preaching for three hours. That can't be right. <laughs> Go back to Genesis chapter 34. Genesis chapter 34. So we see all that to just see what happened. Okay, we see what happened. Now let's look at the aftermath, the consequences of what happened. Dinah went out. She met up with the daughters of the land, the Hivites. She went out and she committed fornication with this man. And the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it. Her brothers, her brothers came out, they heard what happened, and the men were grieved and they were very wroth. That means they were mad. They were full of wrath. How many of you have a sister here? I have two. I have two, and my sisters have personally caused me to get into several fistfights. So, I mean, look, these guys were filled with wrath. When somebody even says something bad about your sister, you just want to fight right away. Because he had wrought folly in Israel and lying with Jacob's daughter, which, which thing ought not to be done. And Hamer communed with him, saying, The soul of my son Seshem 
longeth for your daughter. I pray you, give her him to wife. Look, he loved her. He loved her. And make ye marriages with us, and give your daughters unto us, and take our daughters unto you. This man, his dad, comes to make peace. And he says, look, he loves your daughter. And ye shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade ye therein, and go get you possessions therein. And Seshem said unto her father. So now Seshem is talking to Jacob. And unto her brethren and her brothers. He says, let me find grace in your eyes. And what ye shall say unto me, I will give. Ask me never so much dowry and gift, and I will give according as ye say unto me, but give me the damsel to wife. And the sons of Jacob answered Seshem and Hamer his father deceitfully, and said, Because he hath defiled Dinah, Dinah their sister. And they said unto him, We cannot do this thing, to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised, for that were, that were a reproach to us. But in this will we will consent to you. If ye will be as we, that every male of you be circumcised, then we will give our daughters unto you. And we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. But if you will not hearken to us to be circumcised, then we will take our daughter, and we will be gone. And their words pleased Hamer and Seshem Hamer's son. And the young man deferred not to do the thing, because he had delight in Jacob's daughter. He loved her. And he was more honorable than all the house of his father. Look, that doesn't say he was super honorable. It just says he was more honorable than the other people that were amongst his people. Okay, but look, they came, he loved her, he wanted to marry her. So at least he wanted to get it right. But we know that they're not to give their daughters in marriage to the heathen people. So here are these, these two boys, the, the brothers, they say, hey, you know, we would love to do that, but you guys aren't, they make a, make a deal out of the circumcision. So they kind of, you know, they kind of trick them. And, you know, it's kind of a, a funny story if you read it on its face, but it's not really funny if you think about what actually happened. So basically they tell them, you know, you'd have to go be circumcised. So every male of the Hivites in this city, they go and they get circumcised. They do it. They do it. Look at verse 24. And unto Hamor and Seshem, his son hearkened all that went out of the gate of his city. Every male was circumcised and all that went out of the gate of his city. And it came to pass on the third day when they were sore... Look, they're still wounded from the procedure. They, you know, they're all like sore that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. And they slew Hamor and Seshem, his son, with the edge of the sword. And look at this. There's another, there's another aspect right here. And they took Dinah out of Seshem. Look, she was there. She was staying with him. They, they didn't, kidnapping is, man-stealing is punishable by death in the Old Testament too. That's not what they were upset about. He didn't kidnap her. She was just there on her own accord. She was, they, these two wanted to get married and it, it couldn't be. And so these guys pull a trick. They have them all get circumcised. And then they go and they kill every man in the city. Talk about an overcorrection. They go and they kill everybody. They take Dinah out of Seshem's house and went out. And the sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. Look, she was there, first of all. Look at verse 30. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have troubled me to make me stink upon the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And I being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house." These guys went crazy. They killed everybody, and then they took all the cattle, they took all the goods, they even took the, the women. I mean, they, they took everything from this city. They took, I mean, they didn't, this, you know, this was not the right thing to do, as Jacob clarifies in Genesis chapter 49. But the point is, it does point out how serious the sin was, and how serious it was taken by them, even though their wrath you know, went too far. But look at verse 31. Look at verse 31 to make my point on fornication. Look what they said. And they said, these are the boys, Simeon and Levi, should he deal with our sister as with an harlot? That's, look, this is feminism today. This is feminism today. They have literally convinced women, they have literally convinced young ladies to be prostitutes. They have literally convinced women that it is okay to be basically unpaid prostitutes. These men are saying what she did with this man means that she was acting like an harlot. That's how bad it was. 
And that's, I mean, they had the, you know, a bad reaction to it, but the point is, is it's very serious. It's a very serious sin. I don't know how to, I mean, what the world teaches on this and what the Bible teaches on this, it could not be further apart. It could not be further apart. And I mean, it was a cruel, over-the-top response, to be sure. But basically, they said that by, by our sister going into fornication, this man, think about this now. Think about this. Think about, what every, think about everybody you know that you work with. Think about everybody you know that, that you maybe deal with from week to week that just thinks that this, this culture that we live in today where people just shack up and they live together for years and then they move out and they live together with somebody else and fornication is just a normal thing. The, God is looking at it. These guys were looking at it. God sees it as, you know, prostitution. He's like, you're, you're treated, look, it's, think about, think about the, the occupation of an harlot. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. And by these people, you know, with their girlfriends and all this and all the fornication that has happened today, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. That's what the Bible teaches. It's exactly the opposite of what people teach today. Look, it is Satan trying to just take away this, you know, trying to cover up all the sin of the society and make you think it's normal. And that's how he does it. That's how he does it with sin. That's how he does it with everything, with violence. You know, all this stuff that you see. I mean, all these violent video games, violence everywhere. Look, violence becomes no big deal. Violence becomes no big deal. It's the same thing with this. But they looked at this man treating their sister like he's treating her. This fornication means he's treating her like a whore. Is what they looked at. It. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 15. It was for this reason and this over the top, this over the top response. I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, you know, it's hard to say that they didn't take it seriously. <laughs> I mean, they they really came over the top in this cruel response that Simeon's inheritance was surrounded by Judah, and basically Simeon kind of just got absorbed into Judah. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 15. Look at verse number 8. King Asa is talking about here, and when Asa heard these words and the prophet of Oded the and, and the prophecy of Oded the prophet, he took courage and put away the abominable idols out of the land of Judah and Benjamin and out of the cities which he had taken from Mount Ephraim and the re renewed altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. And he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and the strangers with him out of Ephraim and Manasseh and out of Simeon. For they fell to him out of Israel in abundance when they saw that the Lord God was with him. So basically, when you read after the kingdom split about you know, the northern kingdom going into captivity, the northern kingdom splitting from the lower kingdom of Judah, basically Simeon was just kind of like melded into Judah. And you don't really hear about him anymore. They had a pittance of an inheritance compared to the other tribes. So, but the biggest lesson here is, this, is where this started with this sin of fornication. And, and look, I, I don't know how to, how to point it out with what's happening today, how serious we need to take this, but turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you say, yeah, that's all Old Testament law and, and Old Testament stuff. Look, 1 Corinthians and 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is dealing specifically with this sin. And this sin, look, all sins are not equal, folks. All sins do not have the same punishment in the Old Testament, and all sins do not have the same punishment in the New Testament. And as a saved believer, you are going to be under the chastisement of God in your life. So you better take heed to that. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 11. The Bible says this, But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or railer, or drunkard, or extortioner, with such an one, know not to eat. Look, it's so serious that Paul is telling us here that it's not to be allowed in the church. Now, I mean, I've preached whole sermons on church discipline and things like this, but I don't know if many of you know this, but at the beginning of the satellite ministry, I had to deal with this in the church. And basically you're saying, okay, so 
no man, you know, and I've kind of explained this, that it says no man that be called a brother. Meaning, somebody that gets into the church, that's getting plugged into the church, you know, that's, that's showing up on a regular basis and, you know, is, is really serious about moving forward in their Christian life. We're not supposed to allow these things in the church. Now, we had a person that showed up and they were... So, for that reason, we do not allow someone that would be called a brother to be living with their girlfriend or living with their boyfriend in this church. I mean, that's kind of just a, we know that there's fornication there at that point. Look, I don't follow people home. I don't want to do that, you know. And, and, but the point is that, that that's not going to be allowed in the church. And we had a situation where that, was, that, was, that happened. And so there's just an uncomfortable conversation that has to happen there. And, it, you know, basically, I'm kind of like, you know, this thing's just a few weeks into it, and I'm already dealing with this. I'm like, wow. You know, but the Bible says, and, and look, we're not on a hair trigger to kick people out of church. We want people to get right. That's the whole point of the Bible. That's the whole point of church discipline. You know, Pastor Jimenez had a really great sermon on church discipline. I don't know when it was preached, like a week ago. You should, you should watch it. Like, no pastor likes it. No pastor likes doing it. But basically, I met with this person, and I feel like, you know, it's, it's long enough to where I can, you know, tell you I, met, I would meet with this person, and I would say, look, you have three choices. You have three choices. You can either get married, you can move out. That's choice number two. You know, move out, stop fornicating. Or, you know, unfortunately, you have to go to church somewhere else. Those are the three choices. It's pretty simple. And this person chose to go to church somewhere else, to just not, not come back. And look, I mean, there's plenty of unbiblical churches out there that won't care <laughs> what, you, what you do. But the point is, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and you say, oh man, you know, I have had fornication in my past, and this is a real beating, you know, this sermon. I've had fornication in my past, and, and all this, and, you know, but here's the thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, first of all, is trying to get people right. It's trying to, it's trying to get people out of sin. That's the whole point of it. And number two, it's, it's talking about it can't be allowed to go on because we actually care about the people that are in the church. Namely, the kids. Namely, you know, so if you're sitting here thinking like, oh man, these, this is a sermon, this is just beating me up right now. Hey, get over yourself, is what I would say. There's people in this church that haven't been in fornication, and we need to preach hard against this stuff. We need to not be hypocrites about it. Amen. I mean, every single church, you know how many people that I've worked with in the past that are in fornication, living with their significant other or whatever? They go to church every Sunday. What a joke. How could that church ever preach on fornication? How could these kids sit here and grow up in a church? And the pastor's like, fornication bad, don't do it. Everybody says it's good. The Bible says it's bad. And then everybody in the church, or five, ten people in the church, are knowingly in fornication, living with their significant others, not married. What a joke I would be. You think I want to make a joke out of the Word of God? Well, you got the wrong guy for that job. Look. It's about the next generation. It's not about you. Yeah, we're trying to get you right. But we're trying to raise some kids and raise the next generation that doesn't fall into this garbage, that doesn't fall into these lies. Like, oh man, I got these lies. Hey, confess it and move on. Let's go. But look, we have to practice the Bible. And we have to protect this church. Look, the people of the land, they're always going to do this stuff. What sense would it make if we were all separated? Think about how dumb this would be. But this is what other churches are doing. Even Bible-preaching churches. We all were separated. We're living separated lives. And we're, we're not going out to the people of the land. But then we just bring all the people of the land in here. <laughs> I mean, what? You know, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. A little leaven, 1 Corinthians says, would leaven the whole lump. Kids, kids can smell hypocrisy like nothing else. When their parents are preaching something that they're not practicing, when, when the pastor's getting up and he's preaching something that it's obvious that the church doesn't believe, that's hypocrisy. And, and look, kids, it will, it will ruin it will ruin the Word of God. It will ruin... That's why God is telling us this stuff. That's why we get these directions. You know, we don't necessarily have to understand all the directions in the Bible, folks. We just know that they're right. But this is an easy one. And here's another one. Just to, you know, just, just to close on this. Here's another point. 
Here's another point. You think about, this is also a great lesson on how sin can curse, how your sin, your personal sin, can curse future generations. Simeon, this, this situation happened. We're reading in Joshua chapter 19 about them getting this land. This situation happened 500 years previous. Your sin can curse future generations. A thousand percent it can. You say, oh, but the, the sins of the father are not going to be punished on the son. Oh, but you know what? Guess how many kids whose dad was a drunk become a drunk? You will pass those sins on. Think about the sin of fornication. Just think about, just think about folks. Think about families that you know that there has been past fornication in the family. And that family is still suffering those consequences now. Everybody got right. Still, consequences still there. Think about the kids. Of, just think about the broken families from fornication. From this. You'll be a testimony to your children. A good one. You're, you're going to be a testimony to your children. You're going to be a testimony to your grandchildren. Whether you like it or not. You're like, I want to be a good testimony. Well, be a good one, but you could also be a bad one. Yeah. Broken families, that will, they will, that will mirror, broken families will mirror generations. That's exactly what we see here. Your sin, your sin can curse your children. It can curse your children's children. It can curse your children's children's children. And on and on and on. Because they will pick up those sins. Go read the Bible. Go read the Bible and, and get you know a, a search program and, and search the sins of Jeroboam. Jeroboam's dead. Two hundred years, three hundred years. What are you talking about? He's the leader of the kingdom. He got into some certain sins. Guess what? So did everybody else for hundreds of years. The sins of Jeroboam. The sins of Jeroboam. The sins. Of, Jeroboam's dead, but the people kept doing the sins. The sins of Jeroboam, they just reverberated through generations. What would they be saying? The sins of you? Will they reverberate through generations? That, I mean, how, many, how many stories do you need like this? How many stories do you need like this in the Bible? The tribe of Simeon. Some really good lessons to learn here to, you know, on how not to do things. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father,